Welcome, welcome again, everybody. Welcome, Kakani. This is um, sort of an extension session to the Big Picture 2, uh, where we have uh, been chatting for the last two days about Vintic imagery issues um, across the UK, but increasingly sort of reaching out abroad and seeing seeing what other, what other great things are going on around the world. Now, um, earlier on today, we ran through, um, ran through the, the uh, program um, for the day, and this, this is just sort of a special add-on session. Um, today, um, Kakani Katija is joining us from, um, from the eastern, the western seaboard, which is the eastern Pacific, um, uh, from the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research in um, Institute, where she works as a principal engineer. And you are doing so many different projects that I couldn't possibly summarize them all in the one place. I had a look at your bio on, on the Envirey site. <laughs> There's an awful lot of stuff, but I think, I think um, you, know, you know, the main thing to note is that you've been involved with this project for a while now and, and very exciting things are happening at the moment. And so, um, uh, you know, we, we, we on the call would be really interested to ask you a few questions on that. Um, we, we ran through in one of the earlier sessions today, I'll just bring up this, um, this uh, slide here. Oh, um, yeah, th um, we have, we have these uh, project working groups that are organized in our, in our, in our, um, in our Benthic image reaction plan. And if I go a step back, there are 87 tasks that we've identified as a group, interconnected, interrelated tasks that are cross theme in their operation, all these little boxes. And we aim to, we aim to deal with all of these one by one, um, or many at once if possible, but it's not going to be, um, straightforward. So we've, so we've, we've sort of aggregated these a little bit into sort of project working groups and um, the groups we had in particular um, uh, uh, that would be of particular interest today were machine learning approaches for benthic imagery and benthic imagery data flows archives and catalogs and those are the ones that um, in which we showed your ocean shot presentation earlier um, uh, so um, uh, there, there were many questions at the time, and we thought we'd just park those to the evening. Now, ten points for whoever can remember any of those questions. Um, uh, even five points for a starter. And um, I'll give you a couple of minutes, sure, to 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 put um, hands up or 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 to pop any questions in the chat. And if not, um, I've got a few myself, so I'll just pause there and um, see what we have. OK, and then, you know, today I don't have anything fancy prepared, uh, but I just, you know, wanted to take the opportunity to have like a conversation with you all about the things that we've been working on, the approaches that we've taken and also how we've gone about implementing them. Um, because at this point we have both a, a back end, a REST API that's been already developed, uh, and now we're finishing up the front end for people to interact with, upload and download data. Um, and so perhaps I guess a good starting point could be the, the the grand vision, right, of FathomNet. And really what we're trying to do is is leverage the um, the energy that we've seen for terrestrial data sets. In particular, the ImageNet, which is a training set that uh, people in AI or computer vision have really used to develop algorithms against. Um, that's part of the reason why deep learning now is as is becoming kind of the go to algorithm for automated detection and classification of objects in imagery. It's because it's been proven on this uh, publicly available data set. And so what we're trying to do or what we're trying to envision is this concept that uh, we could create something similar, but for the underwater realm. And because of the challenges, right, of being able to collect this kind of imagery, it can't just involve one particular research group or one particular research institution. Uh, if we want global coverage um, across species of marine animals, let's say, uh, we need to have a lot of contributors to, to the project or to the effort. Um, but really what makes these training sets uh, effective is that they lower the barrier to entry to these kinds of problems 
And by that, I mean they're, they're public, they're available, they use fair data principles, which I think you all have discussed during this uh, program. And, um, you know, also being more open to use of the data, not just for academic uh, and research purposes, but also for commercial purposes. Because at least you know, in my region, there's a lot of interest for commercial entities to be developing new technologies to address some of our exploration problems, right? And so continuing to isolate ourselves from, you know, the capabilities that we might see in the commercial industry could be problematic. Um, and so these are ways in which we've tried to at least approach this problem of creating a, a, a database that everybody can uh, contribute to and um, access. Um, so I'm happy to pull up the the website now if if you're interested or if you have any general questions before I, I get started. I can't tell if anyone has a hand up, but maybe not. <laughs> I'll just have a look for hands up. Uh, I can't see any hands up. I can't okay. see any questions at the moment, so I think you're good to go. OK. Oh, I think oh, Chris oh, wait. Put his hand oh. up. <laughs> I'll go on. Go on. There, there we go. <laughs> oh, nice to meet you. I, I've just, I, I'm thinking more broadly here about the, about particularly the idea of the open access model of publication, right, as an example of this issue. What we might end up doing here is collecting a resource and then have like the commercial sector basically charge us to use the products that we might have fed them to develop their software solutions. You know, and it's like, how can we make sure that we keep a stake in the resource that we develop and mm. to make sure that we don't lose ownership of that further down the line? That's a really great question. And it's something that we can't, well, when we've thought about this a lot, it's something that we can't necessarily force. Um, I'll, I'll explain to you the specifics about the data use policy that we've come up with. But the goal for FathomNet is not only to create this training set, but also this kind of cultural norm where if you're using the data, you're also contributing your models to the FathomNet GitHub. The idea being then that you can publicly make those models available, including the filters, right, that you use to uh, download or gather training data so that the models then could be replicated let's say, but also utilize in a lot of different applications. So it's something we can't necessarily force. I mean, we could try, but then we might see uh, participation drop pretty dramatically, but it's something that I think we could really push for uh, and suggest strongly uh, for participation. And so for instance, what we're doing right now, like I'm, I'm in the midst of writing the first manuscript right for FathomNet, and what we're doing is we're going to be posting uh, two algorithms, uh, both a, a midwater classifier uh, or detector, depending on the, the, the classes you're interested in using, and then a benthic uh, detector uh, on this FathomNet GitHub repo, just to help you know, lay out what the requirements are, the expectations are for, uh, you know, for the use of this information and data. But it, it's, it's, it, it's a good point and it's hard at least and the, the the people that we've been having these discussions with about the the application or about the um, sorry the database having that extra hurdle could be difficult or problematic. Yeah, I, particularly I can imagine like it'd be less of an issue with academic institutions that are developing their own solutions to these problems. But thinking about it from the agencies that are collecting the data, that they're oftentimes not they will end up with proprietary solutions. So if we're trying to develop open source solutions to these problems and there's com competition from commercial sectors, you could end up actually with a real conflict of interest. But yeah, it's an interesting thing to talk about for sure. It, it's something we're aware of and there is, at least I haven't been able to come up or our team hasn't been able to come up with a perfect solution, but this was one way that we thought could really just open, you know, open our, our capacity beyond, you know, one group individual that's training an algorithm and then not not making it available to everybody. Um, so let, uh, any other questions? Because that's a, a good one to start. There's a conversation. Image databases that are used this way. Yes, so commercial companies can use these data sets. Um, 
uh, I would should say in the original implementation of ImageNet, commercial companies couldn't use it. You had well, you had to have uh, like permission through the the consortium or the group that was uh, using ImageNet. I should say later on, then emerged a number of different training sets. An example is Coco, and so that was um, uh, I can't remember what it stands for, but it's something images in context, uh, and that was started by Microsoft and. But, but and now we're starting to see a lot of private or for profit companies creating their own training sets or training data. Uh, in the case of Coco, everybody can use it, but there's a lot of proprietary data sets out there. Um, and so, you know, that keep in mind, at least for Coco, both academic research and co uh, commercial applications can use the data. And what we've done, and I'll um, pull up the data use policy to show how. Um, we, we tried to restrict the commercial use of the data to only algorithm development um, because we thought that was incredibly important, you know, as, as an institution and Bari is absolutely protective of, of their imagery and, you know, they, they want to be sure that that data is, is being used responsibly. And, um, you know, that's something we can't chase after people, right, to implement because we don't have money to do that legally. But what we can do is make that very clear in the use policy about what's appropriate use and what isn't. All right, great. So here is um, the landing page for FathomNet. And um, the, the point here is we really want to provide a, a data portal or portal for individuals to be able to interact with the data really easily. Uh, we didn't want to create some really, you know, non -im immersive uh, um, platform where people are only interacting with uh, imagery or data via portals or via directories. We wanted it to be, you know, easy for people to, to use and understand what data is actually living in the database. And I should say right now, um, you know, it's still in development, so we've loaded data multiple times, so you'll see replicated uh, localizations or annotations. Um, it also includes only Ambari's data, but before we launch, we're going to include Ambari uh, National Geographic and NOAA data because they are currently our, our data partners on this. Um, but but anyways, so before I start diving into the data, I just want you all to know that that's why you're seeing some some strange things. Um, but you know, this landing page, you have the ability to either search for an individual concept, um, search for a location, which is we um, mapped from the marine regions org website for suggestions on what marine regions should be, you know, including like lat, Latin long bounding boxes. So that's built in already. And then taxonomy providers, which I think is important for the group here, because I imagine you all are trying to come up with perhaps a consistent taxonomy. Um, that the idea is that uh, if your group or if your organization or if your region has a certain taxonomy uh, that you are utilizing, um, if it has an API, we can incorporate that into the database. And so right now we have, you know, worms. We also have Ambari's, uh, Ambari's knowledge base or taxonomy provider. Um, we're going to be in discussions with the Squiddle group next week. Uh, so that would then necessarily allow for the Katami uh, taxonomy provider. So depending on what you all use uh, for your taxonomy, we can incorporate that into here and and the reason why we wanted to do this we wanted to provide this flexibility is you know all all of us researchers we have our preference right we have a preference as to which well also we have a geographical preference right because that's where our observations are and so instead of expecting everybody to conform to just one taxonomy especially one that's constantly changing as we discover new animals um you know we wanted to provide that flexibility so you know, if the UK Big Picture Project, I don't know, if, if Hank, if if that's something you all are trying to kind of coalesce around. I know, um, I think it's Carrie is trying to do the Smarter ID um, project. Um, but anyways, the idea is if you have a taxonomy you like to use for your um, your annotations, we can ingest that here. Um, the other thing too, and this 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 isn't actually done, but what our goal is, is to also allow people to kind of go through the website and the landing page and also have, uh, you know, a metric where we're constantly 
um, providing information about how much data is currently living uh, in the database as well as the number of contributors. Um, and so the this explore page is actually the, the major meat of the, the website. And so as I said earlier, the idea is we want to provide opportunities for people to really visually understand and play around with how with, with what the data is uh, currently in the database. And so there's a number of different fields here. So we have, you know, what, what, where, and the taxonomy provider, which you saw on the original page. We can also filter by dates. Uh, we can also filter by imaging type, which I'll get back to because that's going to be really important. Um, you can also uh, filter by owner institution. And so we're, we're very careful of ensuring. So that's some of the metadata that we collect is, you know, who is the owner institution of this data or the owner um, group of this data because we want to make sure that people can track back to the original owner in case they want to use the data for another, um, you know, another, I guess, use outside of machine learning uh, algorithm development. And then finally, and I'm going to get to this a little bit later, we have ver verification status. And this is where um, developing a community right of researchers around this fathomet effort is going to be really uh, really important um and so if i were to do a search i've been really interested in, in this organismal group lately and then just run a search on the taxonomy provider it'll it'll yield uh you know the geographic locations of uh the the animals or at least the observations um and then also a list of images for uh, that that pertain to the um, that concept. Uh, the other thing that we can do is instead of using this um, keyword search, we can also use the concept tree that underlies uh, the database. And so here we're pointing to the Mbari database just because uh, that's that's the default now. Again, if the community has a, a much stronger inclination to use another version, we can wire that in here. Um, but the idea is that you know using this taxonomic tree you can either select um, you know specific groups like species or you can select an entire genus or let's say subfamily and then you can either select exact match or all descendants which will you know generate um, more images or more imagery uh, for that case um, and so this is so bes besides the keyword search you can also do uh, this concept tree search uh, to generate uh, imagery that you can include or use for your um, training data. And so what you can do is you can select all of the images here and download them. And then what you will actually download is a, a JSON file that has a, a link to where the image can be found, as well as all the accompanying metadata uh, with each individual image. And so this is this is an important point uh, that I want to get to about the um, the data use policy later. But the point is, is we're providing URLs or you know HTML links to the images instead of a you know giant zip file uh, for the images themselves. And so there's a reason why we're wanting to do that. We actually strongly want to leverage you know, distributed hosting of the data. Um, and then we're trying to motivate, you know, researchers or institutions that have the capacity to do that um, because it's also a, a mechanism to maintain copyright of, of that imagery or of that data, um, which I'll, I'll explain a little bit more. Uh, another, I think, key feature of this um, is that, you know, as here, if you if you look at an individual image, uh, you can see um, all of the metadata. So for instance, you can see there's two concepts here and they're the same, but that's because we've copied the, you know, the database. Um, but you'll notice that in this case, we've got another concept here, this squid, probably door to this. Um, and so that can be a, a problem, you know, as us, our, I'd say as researchers, you know, trying to annotate our own imagery, there tends to be a focus on maybe fish or maybe coral. And so what that means is a lot of time when we do localizations, we're only localizing the groups that we're interested in studying, but thereby leaving other organisms or other objects as unidentified. 
And so the reason, part of the reason why we want to include this next tool that I'm showing you is um, so that we can augment the data that currently exists or correct the data that currently exists within Fathomnet. So you can do something like, you know, draw, oop, here we go. So draw a um, bounding box around this object or feature that hasn't been uh, identified previously. Um, so I, th I think it's Dory to this. I'm probably wrong. Um, and then you just hit enter. And then you can. Um, uh, and then you can save that addition and then move on. Um, sorry, anyways, I don't think I'm logged in, which is why my savings are or my uh, changes are being saved. The, the other the other important point I want to make is that. Sorry, I think I'm going all out of um, all out of whack, but maybe now is a good time to pause. Um, and there's additional information besides concepts, but also revealing other metadata that's been submitted as part of each image. So here the location, the depth, the date of the observation, um, as well as you know what collection or how was this image submitted to the database. And you know these are things that you can do to track back or additional tags and metadata that um, you know researchers might find important to include with uh, with along with all the other metadata as well. Um, so any any questions before I continue? I have a question, I have a question. Um, to start mm -hmm. off with, and I'm sure that other people will join in in a second with their hands or, or in the chat. Um, but when you were talking about the taxonomy as a, a selection part when you're searching, is that a field that has to be populated when you search? Because I wonder whether you might miss records that are appropriate because they have a, a, a classical taxonomic identification and you're using a classical taxonomic structure, but with a slight change or slight variation. And you might mm -hmm. miss that data if you're just searching in one kind of, I guess, in one tree or one grouping of how people have identified things. Right, that's a really good question. And right now we don't have the capability. You have to select a, um, a taxonomy to get uh, data. And, and that's just because of the way that we built the database now. Obviously, the ideal state would be if we didn't have to enter taxonomy uh, at all, and you could then just return all the results, let's say, that match the concept. So we're, we envision that kind of as like maybe a phase two implementation for the database. We're not, we're not there yet, um, but that's, that's a really great point. Great, that's really, that's really cool. Um, I think there is a raised hand from Chloe. Hi, yeah, um, I was just wondering, uh, so you said that, that people can submit their images from different uh, institutions and um, you're just providing this URL to get there. What is there in terms of quality control for that? Is is there sort of any in-house um, sort of look at the images before you accept them and put them on your website? Uh, so there there is a little bit of quality control. So what we wanted to do was we didn't want to set up a database that was only accepting data from, you know, the, the ivory tower institutions. Uh, we wanted to enable individuals, it could be scuba divers, what have you, to contribute information to the database. But the extra layer of quality control that we're trying to impose is this verification step. And it's this verification step that, you know, someone, either an expert, some member of the FathomNet community, which, you know, it feels a bit hand wavy now, but we have a couple of ideas for how to do this, um, would be to, uh, to basically, let's say, if you have an area of expertise, let's say you're a squid biologist, uh, and, you know, you are interested in contributing to FathomNet, uh, what we're trying to do is set up a notification system so that any time uh, you know, that concept sh shows up or emerges in the database, you could then go, you could be alerted and then go to the website and then just really quickly verify if that object is indeed uh, what was annotated. And so there's, what so that, that means is that verification step. So if I were to show you, um, let me, re oh, I'm not, I'm still sharing. Okay, so if I go, again, I, I don't know if, my login 
normally Brian Schlinning, which I think a lot of you know, so he's the architect behind the video annotation and reference system. He is also the architect behind uh, this, uh, the Fathomet database. Um, let's see. So I'm going to go back and filter where I can only look at unverified images and then search. And let me pull this up. So here, you know, for instance, there, there's um, this is Bath Accordia Stygius. You can edit the verification status and you can mark it as verified. You can reject it or you can edit the annotation. So once and, and this is linked into user permissions, so we have different levels for the users uh, and that's kind of an organic process at this point. Uh, but I know that we're trying to have conversations with you know, folks like the, the DOSI groups, uh, various uh, you know, communities that could be participating in this process of verification. So you see that once that verification status has been completed, right, then if I were to um, accept this one and save it, now the entire image is verified. Um, and so if you are you know, a researcher or if, if there's some use case that absolutely you want to make sure you're only working with quality controlled data, then you would want to search for just uh, verified images. But I have to say that the first phase of this project, we really just tackled the architecture bit. So how do you build the database? How do you build a front end? And then once that's done, we're going to be pivoting really heavily to the community aspects because really what I think this is going to require is almost like a, an iNaturalist scale effort, right? Where we're very careful about including, um, you know, people's contributions, but also understanding that, you know, there's there's certain there's expertise that's very limited, but then there's, you know, general understanding or or interest that could be leveraged um, if we were just really careful about, you know, designing a, a citizen science project around it. Um, so we have some ideas, but we're, we're just starting to brainstorm uh, how to do this, you know, using video games or, uh, you know, citizen science projects, etc. Any other questions? I noticed that Carrie said that uh, you all talked about inclusion of Smarter ID once it's launched, and that that would absolutely be fantastic. So if that's the if there's an API, then that we could just call from Smarter ID, then that we can easily incorporate that into the Fathomnet database. Um, and then I think Chloe, your hand is up, or your hand is no longer up. No, sorry, it's another one. I'm getting excited. I think <laughs> so. I'm brewing your questions. And um, I was just thinking, it's, it, being that it's made by Ambari, do you have any sort of um, preference to be focused on? Uh, images from that region, or is it your hope to really make this global? Fantastic. Yes, because the problem right we face and, and I'm you know, I'm approaching this from kind of an engineering perspective. I, I should back up and say the reason why I'm really excited about the potential for this is like I want to I want to create robots that will go out and and sample, you know, an environment totally remote uh, autonomously and you know, be able to count animals, let's say in midwater, um, and, and be able to really do some fantastic coverage in a region or globally. But also what I wanna do is, is train algorithms that will go out, that will enable a vehicle like this to go out and find animals that we haven't like discovered before, right? And observe it and track it for a period of time. So in order for this to be success, for that to be successful, we need this underlying data uh, for that kind of application. Um, and so th that's where, you know, if, if we really want to, let's say, populate Fathom that with a thousand images per, uh, per like novel individual for each species of animal, let's say, it, that we find in the marine uh, environment, that's a lot of images. <laughs> and Mbari does not have sufficient coverage, right? Uh, but what we've learned through this process is that uh, algorithms trained on Ambari's data can actually be used to um, automate uh, classification and uh, detection in NOAA's footage, as well as no National Geographic Society's drop camera footage. Uh, and so that's that's part of the reason why that you know we've we've really pushed on this 
effort within Ambari because, you know, finally we're, we're starting to see some value for all of this data that we've been sitting on for ages and ages. Um, yes, Tim or no? Oh, you're waving. <laughs> okay, I want robots that will sample autonomously, so that's great. Great. I think there's a question in the chat from Graham. Okay. Regarding the, the data model or database structure. Um, to help with the generic development of a marine annotation data standard for sharing annotations between systems. Uh, right, so um, I can share, let's see if I can remember where it is, um, www.adamnet.org. Uh, one second, let me see. So we have the, I have a website to the, like three different definitions of the API. Let's see if I can find it. Normally, Brian just pulls this up and I don't pay attention to where it lives. Um, OK, here we go. And I might need to be on VPN to pull it up. Yeah, if there's, if there's problems with the internet, we can pick that up later, maybe in a separate conversation. If anyone else has got any other questions they want to raise, um, and I and I can provide a link to that. Um, the the other thing I want to also point out is um, Embari's knowledge base. I don't know if you all have seen this or have seen Embari's deep sea guide. It just lives in this uh, corner of the internet, um, and so this is the taxonomic tree that. Uh, Mbari is currently using. I want to point out that we're obviously using the same taxonomic tree uh, for Mbari's data, but I think the thing that I'm also really excited about and something that we've been talking to a number of different individuals about is the fact that, you know, while I'm talking primarily about marine organisms, there are obviously other concepts within a taxonomic tree that you can include that expands beyond marine animals, um, such as here, like biological structure, um, or, uh, let's see, geologic feature, um, which, or let's say geological morph, not morphology, not this one. Da -da -da. Sometimes it works. Substrate composition. And the reason why I think this could also be valuable, right, is, uh, you know, people like Blair Thornton are doing a lot of work using uh, unstructured uh, learning to uh, kind of identify or distinguish between benthic regions or benthic types, as opposed to like drilling down to individual animals, but characterizing um, benthic environments. And so you could also include in your taxonomic tree uh, class classes that could capture that information as well. Um, and so I want to say that FathomNav is not restricting itself to just marine organisms. Uh, what we're restricting, though, ourselves to is imagery of an object that's underwater, uh, preferably in the ocean. Um, and the reason why that that is pretty broad definition um, is because one of the ideas was to potentially reach out to aquariums to see if they would be able or interested in, in contributing data to you know, some of the animals that are in their collections, for example. Fantastic. I think we've got a question from Kerry. Unmute would help, wouldn't it? Um, <laughs> hi, Pekani. Um, hi, Kerry. I just um, wanted to check with your with the database as it is at the moment. Can you filter your search for benthic images as opposed to pelagic um, and higher level taxa? Or I mean. Yeah, how do the filters work? I guess <laughs> is what I'm asking there. Let me let me see. Um, well, really, we don't. We so we haven't labeled our images as you know water column or benthic. Um, the 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 additional data. So if I were to just pull this up, um, the additional metadata that we include in this case is location, depth, and the, the date of the observation. 
And uh, I'm trying to see if I add a collection. Um, what we, we use is the Darwin Core uh, archive uh, metadata. Um, and so this is actually the submission page that you would see. So we're tracking who the rights holder and owner's institution is. Um, uh, where is... We also have a list and I'll have to, I don't remember where it, it lives, but there's a list of metadata that we're, you know, we're open to, but we're also not constraining fields. So if there's an additional tag, like you want to add for your group, as in Midwater or Benthic, you could do that. Um, but what we don't, that isn't a requirement that we have for the data carry. So it's not a straightforward filter. Hmm. There was another part to your question though, Carrie, that you asked. Oh yeah, it was It was just about, sorry, I was just thinking about, hmm, there's loads of data here, I could use it. <laughs> I was thinking, what would I want to download? But um, yeah, just, I guess you can download on, on higher level taxa. So say you wanted all the Nadarians, is that, is that possible? Or, that is possible. Or, or the whole database if you wanted it, but. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is possible. So I'm only showing you right how you can interact with the website, but there's um, so I go to, but there's, you know, the whole API that you can just pull pull images from. So if uh, we can, so there's no, if I just do a Gina, a Gina sit, and we'll do a search, and then I'll go here. Oh, can I not go up? I know I can go up. Again, we're just. What's higher than a Gina date and Gina date for some reason? Gina day. Um, okay, well, that's something I think I'll have to talk to Brian about fixing. Um, but through the API, right, you can grab all of the images or all of the descendant images from a higher level uh, taxonomy. Um, we, we should be able to do that through this interface. Um, that's just a, a feature I think we'll have to, to correct and fix. I'll add that to our, our to-do list. <laughs> um, let's see what else. I'm going to write this down. But you know, we're, the, the website isn't, we haven't made it public yet because we're still dealing with like data issues and making sure that the, the, the plumbing works well. Um, but we're, if, you know, if any one of you want to play around with the, the website or, you know, really help us um, give us some advice or your opinion about things or, you know, constructive criticism, we're definitely open to doing that. Um, so you just would have to reach out to me and I can give you the login credentials. Um, so navigating concept tree up to higher uh, taxonomy levels. That's, um, that's a really that's valid point. I'm sure there's a lot of people that would be happy to help with any kind of testing of it. I mean, it, it looks really awesome. Yeah, I'm definitely keen to have a play. Um, Chloe, I don't know whether your hand's still up from previously or whether you've got another question. Uh, it's down for me. I will have more questions, but I'll <laughs> stop talking for a bit, I think. <laughs> well, then maybe let me um, share the data use policy because I think that's really important. What is going on? So FathomNet, my collections, add collections. Oh, it's also in about us. So this about us page is totally not done. Um, so ignore it. But this is the, the FathomNet use policy. And I spent a lot of time on this policy. I've also talked with a lot, a lot of different legal representation, particularly in the Silicon Valley uh, space. Um, because you know, there's all these training data or training sets that are found in, in the region and trying to make sure that what we're, we're, we're proposing is is reasonable, but also is is very careful with the data and imagery that are provided by these various institutions um, or contributors. But the important point is that annotations of the data set are made, are licensed under a Creative Con Commons attribution, no derivatives, 4.0 international license. Um, but the images, this is an important distinction because the FathomNet, con we say consortium, I'm going to get rid of this, but FathomNet provides images via a list of URLs um, and notwithstanding 
the foregoing, all of the images may be used for training and development of machine learning algorithms for commercial, academic, and government purposes. And this was important. Uh, however, the, the information is licensed under a more strict Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives, uh, 4.0 international uh, license. So the, the reasoning is, is you know, a stricter license, but then only allow one use case for commercial uh, uses is the machine learning algorithm development. Now, the the question though that comes into play is is who has or maintains the copyright on the images? And so if you are at a research institution or you are have the capability to host your own data, so what that means is, you know, you can create a public URL uh, at your home institution and then share with us or Fathomnet just the URL where that, that image lives along with the metadata of that imagery. Um, what that does is it allows you to maintain copyright and you're just licensing to Fathomnet the use of, of that image for the application. But because we recognize not everyone has this capacity for hosting their own data, we have talked about an option where we could the Fathomnet website could host that data. And, you know, this is under, I think, special circumstances. We don't want that to be the norm. Um, but if you do provide the data for Fathomnet to locally host, what that means then we ask you to relinquish your copyright of those images. Because again, Fathomnet doesn't want to be the person hunting people down if, if copyright infringement has happened. Right, we, we're trying to stand up Fathomnet to kind of live on its own without having to have all this administrative overhead uh, to you know, track people down if, if they're, if they're um, overstepping their use. But then this important point, right? So for all of the uses of the images, the user should contact the original copyright holder. So if you're hosting your own data, you're the original copyright holder, you maintain that copyright, but also you know, this um, important piece, if you're having or asking Fathomnet to host it, uh, you've already relinquished your copyright, and so Fathomnet will will make it available for other uses. So just just keep that in mind because you know we, we want right we want Fathomnet to really be this resource for people to uh, interact with and aggregate this with this data. We don't want Fathomnet to be the host of all of this data. Uh, we really want to leverage distributed hosting so that this project can really scale right. Um, as you all know, image data is, is expensive um, and it, the more we can distribute kind of hosting of that information, the better. Um, so I'm happy to send this to you all if you want to look at it um, in more detail. But that that's kind of the, the approach, the compromise we were able to come up with uh, because, you know, institutions like Ambari are, are very kind of possessive of their their data, their their imagery. And so this is the, the hurdles we I had to jump over um, to get them willing to open it up. Can I just ask a quick question on that before I'm assuming other people will have questions too? Yeah. Uh, as part of the download process, if you're requesting images, does that cop contact the copyright holder as a part of that process? Or is that something that's separate? So people can download the images, I guess, without your knowledge, if you're holding them locally or, or you know, through, not locally, but through a URL they'd still be able to download them, I guess, without asking. Right, so that that's kind of what we, we, we built it that way for a number of reasons, because we didn't want to be tracking people's activity, right? There's, there's all these reasons for why that, that's not a, a good thing. Um, but when you look at the image data, you know, say you had something beautiful, much more beautiful than whatever this is, um, you know, what you can do is you can, uh, navigate to say, you know, oh, I want to use this on a poster. You can navigate to a collection and within the collection, you know, it'll it'll have all of the images, you know, from that uh, submission or that collection. And it'll also include the Darwin core data that was uh, submitted as part of the collection. And so here you will get information about, you know, either the license of that image or the collection, um, but also who the owner institution is. Uh, and and who the rights holder is. So there's a mechanism for you to kind of track back to the original owner of of that image. And so it's on them. And we say that in the um, 
let's see about us in the fathom net data use policy the that the um for all other uses of the images users should contact the original copyright holder so we put the onus on the the, the person who wants to use the images for something else to reach out um, to the original copyright holder okay great i think there's a question to come in from the chat um from kerry saying um, so that speaks to a national distributed facility that supplies data to FathomNet. Yeah, sorry, I just clarified. I was just from what you were saying about the copyright license, it sounded like, yeah, we we maybe have a a national facility that 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 uh, FathomNet could pull data from, but the ownership would then be retained by UK PLC or whatever. Is that is that the way of thinking about it, or is, did I misinterpret? I mean, that's one approach. It could even be more distributed, right? So if you're at an institution where, you know, you have hosting capability, you could, you know, create separate URLs for every one of your images and then just submit the, you know, submit the list of URLs to FathomNet directly. So it, it doesn't have to come from a central, you know, like regional data repository, right, for you to maintain copyright. If your university has the, or you know, institution has the resources, your own website, you can create separate URLs for your images um, and submit them that way. They don't, it doesn't have to go through uh, oh, okay. a data aggregator. So, sorry, just so I'm not incredibly thick, which I am most of the time. Um, so, so I'm just thinking at the moment, then we create individual URLs for working in Beagle. So yeah. all of our imagery has individual URLs. The annotation files come out of Beagle, so theoretically we can just submit that to FathomNet now, yep. and that would do something useful. Right, and so I should say I had a conversation with Tim Nat Kemper yesterday about this, and we've discussed potentially working out a tighter integration between Beagle and FathomNet. So, I mean, in an ideal world, you know, you as a researcher who might be using these annotation tools could select a box and say, yes, I want to contribute that data to FathomNet and it would yeah. be done. There's some engineering that's still required in order to do that, but that's kind of the goal that we're, we're hoping to achieve because, you know, everybody has their own flavor of annotation tool oh, yeah. and <laughs> we don't care what one you're using, right? Um, and so, like, I'm talking with, um, the group that created Squiddle next week. Um, obviously, I already have the VARS group on board because um, Brian's doing all the work. But, but you know, so that that's kind of where we're hoping to go with this um, because the URLs already exist. It's it's already being hosted by you, I guess, in some way. Yeah. Um, and you know, why reinvent the wheel? Great. Great. <laughs> Thanks. Great question. Anything else? Um, and I'm, I'm happy to answer more questions. I should say that, you know, this is kind of a preview of what obviously we're hoping to do. And um, when I get my act together and, and submit our fathom paper, what I'm going to try and do is, is schedule a workshop that's focused on FathomNet um, where we can do a deep dive into, you know, how do you upload data? How do you download data and work with the data? Um, and so that would be most likely late April or mid May. Um, and so, you know, please share with your networks that this is coming up. I know what DOSI is offered to um, advertise the, the workshop and, and Tim Nut Kemper, you know, through his Beagle network will also advertise it as well. Yes, yeah, so if you let us know when that's set up, we can circulate that within the big picture group here. So everyone here is a and, and more widely that couldn't make it today are able to attend if they think it's going to be useful for themselves. So yeah, if you let us know, we can we can definitely look at, at letting people know it's happening and then um, it that way. I don't know whether anybody else has, has got any questions. I can't see any raised hands, but my team has been really playing up today. So if somebody does have a raised <laughs> hand, please let me know. Yeah, it's the end of the day, so I, for yeah. you. <laughs> I'll, throw, I'll throw you a very quick one, and, and it's more just a point of interest, maybe. Um, for us, in terms of uh, thinking about regional fisheries stock assessment uh, data sets that might be able to supplement or add more value for you guys, 
I mean, I, I had, are you working with the, the Woods Hole Group from the Hubcam side of things? So, so there's a, a number of different approaches we're trying to take. So, oh, remember on the website, I realize I'm still sharing this, but um, on the website, when you go to the Explore page, there's this filter about imaging type. So this is really important because what we're wanting to do is not constrain this to just like ROV footage that's collected. Um, and, you know, as you all know, depending on what the object is you're trying to observe, depending on the scale, right, it requires either really refined quantitative imaging systems or, you know, our more basic ROV, uh, you know, footage. And so what we're trying to do is, so we have this imaging type, it's not, it's not constrained, but say you're a community of researchers that use the UVP or the um, the imaging flow cytobot or something like that, that community can, can community can decide what label they want to use for an imaging type. And then that data can be uploaded to Fathomnet. Um, so, so like, for instance, I talked to Jules Jaffe about this and his Scripps Plankton camera project, and he's interested in contributing his training data uh, to Fathomnet. And so, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's open uh, for those individuals to, or groups to um, submit data. So if, if you think of any other group that, um, you know, would be, you know, valuable uh, contributors, please either share with them, um, you know, that the video I think that Hank sh shared or, you know, put put them in touch with me because, yeah, the goal the goal here really is it's a big problem and no single person is going to be able to solve it, right? Um, but but I, I just say that FathomNet, like we're not a beagle. We're we're not we're not providing let's say an annotation tool. We do have those capabilities built into web, the website, but that's not really what FathomNet is built for. What it's built for is a a clearinghouse let's say for training data so at a very minimum right we want the we, we want information about the image uh, we don't require really any additional metadata besides uh, the class or the object that's in the, the image and a localization uh, in the current version of fathomnet it's a bounding box um, so you know we we won't just accept an image without a localization let's say that's that's kind of the 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 minimum requirement for uh, entry into the, the database. But like I said, if, if you have images that have multiple concepts that haven't been uh, localized or identified in your images, we have tools built in to the website to enable you to do that. OK, fantastic. I saw Kyrie's hand go up briefly, um, but we are at half past five, so I don't know whether you want to come in quickly, Kerry, and then. No, no, it's fine. It was a stupid question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I want to say a big thank you to yourself, Kakani, just to make sure that people can get off and, and have the rest of their evenings because we've been spending a long time today staring at screens. I'm sure a lot of people are, are ready sure to switch off for the day. Um, but thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for, for spending some time talking us through FathomNet. It's, it's really cool. I'm, I'm very excited about it. It looks really great. Um, and if you have kind of um, your contact details that you're willing to to let I think one of our team have um, we can make sure that people can contact you directly if they've got any further questions or anything that's kind of fallen outside of the the chance to chat today um, yeah to get yeah. in touch with you because I'm sure lots of people will go away think for a bit eat some food and then realize that they've got all these questions that they haven't had a chance to ask so yeah take a um, break yeah <laughs> unfortunately um, I'm very easy to find on the internet so fortunately or unfortunately, so uh, feel free to um, do a quick search, but I did include my email in, in case that's helpful. Okay, well, thank you very much. And thanks everyone for joining and we'll see you all tomorrow. <laughs> thanks, Kikani. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Kikani. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you.